Father in heaven, be with us throughout this midday power surge is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Greetings, salutations to Safe to Surf International and first time viewers. Welcome to this midday power surge. This is your spiritual oasis on this pilgrim journey. I'm your host, Andrew Henriquez, on this Monday, October 2nd. Welcome one, welcome all to this midday power surge. I'm going to forego the introduction. You can take a look in the title and description to see the spiritual menu that we will be addressing today. Well, brothers and sisters, as you can see, time is short. On September 26th, that Tuesday, I covered the following. Say no to digital family card. Digitally enslaving people via government assistance program. Moving people from the country to the cities digitally. That video is on this platform, in this playlist. Please go and take a look at that, watch it or re-watch it. This is going to be part two about what is happening in Kazakhstan. What the Pope is pushing, banning home churches, banning private prayers, banning Bible studies, banning even online worship services, churches and groups that are not registered with the government. And in connection with that, there is a digital family card. Let's get into that, my friends. Kazakhstan. And what are they now launching? The digital family card. In that message I referenced, this past Tuesday, September 26th, this same family card has come to America. This is nothing but surveillance, monitoring of the beast that will lead to the mark of the beast. Listen. One of the 17 global sustainable development goals is reduced inequalities. Countries around the world are striving to increase the volume and improve the quality of support for vulnerable social groups. Kazakhstan is not an exception. Today, there are Clip two. Access to social services is more difficult in rural areas than in urban ones. There are so many types of services that it is difficult for citizens to find the ones suitable for them. In addition, many people are deterred by the fact that they need to apply for each service themselves. Digital transformation helps to overcome these and other challenges. Digital Family Card is a unique solution that came about through a partnership between the government and the United Nations Development Program in Kazakhstan. All right, friends, and here comes clip number three. They're all in our business. Surveillance, monitoring of the beast. A digital card of each contains 80 different indicators. Economic, housing and social conditions, health and education. The information comes from 30 public systems and is updated on a daily basis. The algorithms of the digital family card analyze life situations in families and automatically identify problems that require preventive measures to be taken by the state. Is there a newborn in the family? The digital family card will offer to get welfare benefit. Do you have a low income? It will calculate the targeted assistance. Do you have preschool children in your family? It will find a kindergarten nearby for your child. All right, friends. Sounds good, right? Huh. Mixing poison with wholesome food. Previously, in order to receive support, citizens had to sort through the register of services, collect certificates, and personally visit various institutions. And now it looks like this. People no longer need to ask for help. They just need to use it. It became easier for the state to provide guarantees to citizens. All right, friends. And with that in mind, now take a look. What are the tools of the New World Order, the mark of the beast? What are those tools? 
See, I think if, if you think what are the tools of the new world, everybody should have a digital ID, everybody should have a bank account, everybody should have a smartphone. Okay. Then anything can be done. Everything else is built on that. Everything else. Listen. Um, I think it, it's very hard for people who've grown up and enjoyed Western liberty and, and human liberty to imagine literally that we're going into a system where literally our homes, our cars, our communities become digital concentration camps. Whoa. Do you see that, my friends? And with that in mind, the policies, draconian mandates in Kazakhstan, the media, influencers are telling us it's the dark side of digital slavery. Last sentence, now is the time to be making plans and preparations for how you will live outside of this burgeoning beast system. Brothers and sisters, what do we need? The five keys of survival. Right now in Kazakhstan, what happened, friends? The ambassador, as well as the president, prime minister, met with Pope Francis, January 10th. Do you see that, my friends? And once they met, notice what was launched in Kazakhstan. A law to ban home groups. A law to ban evangelism. A law to ban religious materials of unregistered groups. If the government does not give you permission and authority, no evangelism. No home worship. Imagine that. The stage is set for the mark of the beast, Sunday worship by law. Look at the connection with the digital family card. They, they will even know if a new baby is born in your home. Would there be a question on that application to get your digital family card? What is your religious persuasion? What church do you attend? Do you go in person? Do you worship online? How many people? Imagine, it's the system, brothers and sisters. And notice, who are the targets? Christians, Muslims, even Jehovah's Witnesses are the target. You can point, pause the video and take a look at that. Red words in the middle. It's a crime to have meeting of worship in your home. Look at that. Passing out religious literature in person or online. It's a crime. Praying in private settings. No personal private Bible studies without government authority. All right. Notice here, friends. I covered this several years ago. Jehovah's Witnesses were what? Banned in Kazakhstan. They were viewed as being fanatics extremists in that same article the source is there who were also targeted with jehovah's witnesses mormons and seventh day adventists why did they fear us seventh day adventists they saw us as their competitors we were winning too many souls winning souls from the russian orthodox community and from the Roman Catholic community. That's it, friends. Signs of the last days. It's right there, friends. Signs of the last days. And that's why at this junction, I'm going to transition and address the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25. And remember the words from Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 289. When we reach the standard God would have us reach, wordlings will call Seventh-day Adventists odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. Was Sister White inspired? Are her writings inspired? There it is, my friends. That was written in the 1800s, and look what is happening now. Extremists. Signs of the last days in Matthew 25. The Bible says in verse number 8 through verse number 12, 10 virgins and the five wise virgins entered an open door. A what, friends? Underscore that. 
an open door. But the five foolish virgins, we're told, encountered a shut door. Note this, the theme of an open and a shut door brings us to the Church of Philadelphia, the sixth in the seven church series of Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 and verse number 8. Let's connect the dots. So verse 10 of Matthew 25, there's an open and a shut door. That means before verse 10 of Matthew 25, what was the church experience? Okay, come back now to Revelation 3. Which church preceded Philadelphia? It was Sardis, the fifth church in the seven church series. Sardis and brothers and sisters. That means the parable of those ten virgins in Matthew 25, it chiefly covers the church time period of Sardis in preparation to transition into Philadelphia. And all these seven churches, or may I say it this way, all the prior six churches, their experiences will be repeated in the final phase, Laodicea. Acts of the Apostles, page 585. All right, with that in mind, let's now take a look at Revelation chapter 3, the church of Sardis, and notice how many times God says, watch, watch. Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 2, be watchful and strengthen, the Bible says, the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Verse 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, watch, I will come unto thee as a thief, the Bible says, and you shall not know what hour I will come upon thee. The thief comes in the night. Those of you who are alive, talk to me. Would the second coming of Jesus be as a thief in the night in the sense that nobody is going to, or that some people will not see it? No. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, all eyes who are alive will see the second coming. Matthew 24, verse 26, verse 27, as the lightning shines from east to west, everyone will see the second coming of Christ. Matthew 25 and verse number 31, the Bible says, when Christ comes, all the holy angels, thousands, thousands, times 10,000 of thousands will come. That's not going to be as some secret as it were, thief, secret. No, the second point here, the second coming of Christ in a second sense will be as a thief in the night for those unrepentant, wicked people. Unrepentant, wicked people will be caught by surprise. Put down 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through verse number 5. Okay. Lastly, in Revelation chapter 3, contextually, what is meant by Christ says, I will come as a thief. If you don't watch, I will come unto thee. It simply means Christ coming to each person's name in the investigative judgment and Christ pronouncing a verdict, a final verdict upon every person's case. Let's confirm that contextually. Revelation 3 and verse number 3. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief in the night. It's individualized upon thee. And verse number 5. He that overcometh, the same will be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name, his name, personal, his name, out of the book of life, but I will confess his name, his name, 
Christ coming to our names in the judgment. Great controversy. Page 590. The chapter entitled, Facing Life's Record. We read, Solemn are the scenes connected with the closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. The judgment, my friends, is now passing in the sanctuary. In the sanctuary above for many years from October 22nd, 1844. For many years, this work has been in progress. Soon, none know how soon it will pass to the cases of the living. Yes, and then it says now, at this time above all others, it behooves every soul to heed the Savior's admonition. And Revelation chapter 3, verse 3 is then quoted. Watch, if thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief in the night. Brothers and sisters, here are the words of Christ to the disciples at the close of his earthly ministry. Mark chapter 13, over and over again in verse 35, watch you therefore. Watch, verse 36, lest coming suddenly, yes, suddenly, he finds you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, 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 brothers and sisters. Now, in the Bible, does anyone know who is live? In the Bible, how many watches are in the Bible? For example, is there one watch? B, two watches? Answer C, three watches? Answer D, four watches. How many watches? All right, thank you. It's four watches. Put these scriptures down. Luke chapter 12. Four watches. Luke chapter 12. And the Bible says, brothers and sisters, in verse number 38, if he shall come in the second watch or in the third watch, Second and third imply there has to be a first watch. But we cannot imply a fourth watch because the Bible can simply say third was the last watch. So where is the scripture that confirms there is a fourth watch? Hold your place in Luke 12. Go to Matthew chapter 14. And the Bible says in verse 25, and in the fourth watch. All right. There it is, friends. Bible. And in Luke chapter 12, when Christ is talking about first, second, third watches, notice what he mentioned in verse number 34. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Does that not bring us to the ten virgins? Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Luke chapter 12 and verse 35. Then verse 36 mentioned a wedding, a marriage. Is that not Matthew 25, the parable of the virgins? And in verse number 39 of Luke 12, it mentions, Watch, you know not when the thief will come. It's all connected in Testimonies for the Church. Volume 2, page 192. Brothers and sisters, this is serious. The five foolish virgins were caught by surprise. They were not watching. In paragraph one, it says this. The waiting ones were represented to me as looking upward. They were encouraging one another by repeating these words. The first and the second watches are past. We are now in the third watch, waiting and watching for the master's return. There remains but a little period of watching now, end quote. I saw some becoming weary. Their eyes were directed downward, and they were engrossed with earthly things and were unfaithful in watching. Listen to what they said next. Listen, friends. They were saying, quote, in the first watch, we expected our master, but were disappointed. 
We thought surely he would come in the second watch, but that passed, and he came not. We may be again disappointed. So therefore, we don't need to be so particular. He may not come in the fourth watch, the following watch. We're in the third watch, and now we think it best, we think it best to lay up our treasure on the earth that we may be secure against want, end quote. Many were sleeping, stupefied with the cares of this life, and, and alert by the deceitfulness of riches from their waiting, watching position. I have several things to say. Because these people are alive today. Many people are saying, why even be so particular in this fourth watch? We have much more time left. Enjoy the world. We don't need to come to save to serve platform. We don't need to listen to prophesy again and yours truly. We don't need to hear about current events fulfilling end time prophecy. The second coming of Christ may come, but not now. We expected it to come before. Many people say, did we not expect him to come October 22nd, 1844? We were disappointed. Number two, did we not expect him to come in 1888? We were disappointed. What happened in 1888? Senator Blair, all right, proposing a Sunder Law Bill in the U.S. Congress. What happened? It was retracted. Next, did we not believe he would come shortly after 1989? We were disappointed. What happened in 1989 for the first time? All right. John Paul II, the Pope, united with Ronald Reagan, then President of America, to overthrow communism. The second coming, sec we were disappointed. Then they go on to say, we were expecting him to come. September 11, 2001, we were disappointed. What happened then? The falling of those towers in New York City? They go on to say we were expecting him to come. In 2008, we have been disappointed. What happened then? The great global financial crisis, housing crisis, yes, and then they're saying now, we expected him to come shortly after March 11, 2020. We have been disappointed so far. What happened then? The official launch and announcement of the pestilence 19 pandemic. We have been disappointed. Christ is not coming for now. That's what they say. And that's why the Bible says... In Luke chapter 12, same chapter that mentions the watches. In verse 34, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Write down Luke 21, verse number 34 to verse number 36. We must be found watching. Do you realize Christ has not given us a time or date for the second coming? I wonder why. This side of the seven last plagues, Christ has not given to us a date for the second coming. Hear what this says, page 191. If such had only known that the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary would close so soon, how differently would they have conducted themselves? How earnestly would they have watched? The master anticipating all this, that's Jesus, gives them timely warning in the command to watch. Jesus distinctly states the suddenness of his coming. Christ does not measure the time. Why? Lest we shall neglect a momentary preparation, a momentary preparation, and in our indolence, look ahead to the time when we think he will come, and as a result, defer preparation. Procrastinate the work of preparation. So what does Christ say? Watch you therefore, for you know not. Yet this foretold uncertainty and suddenness at last 
fails to rouse us from stupidity, to earnest wakefulness, and to quicken our watchfulness for our expected master. Those not found waiting and watching are finally surprised in their unfaithfulness. The master comes, and instead of their being ready to open unto him immediately, they are locked in worldly slumber and are lost, brothers and sisters. Lost. They're lost. At last. And brothers and sisters, let me be clear. They are scoffers now in the last days. Scoffers, my friends. Second Peter chapter 3. The Bible speaks of scoffers. Brother scoffer. Miss Cynic. Yes. And Dr. Mocker. They're all around. Second Peter chapter 3. Verse 3 through verse number 5. The signs are here. But they are willingly ignorant, the Bible says. You know what? Let me give this to you. Page 193, paragraph 3 says, We need not to be doubly watchful. We need more than double watchfulness, more than triple watchfulness. We need quadruple watchfulness. I wonder why. Because we're now in the fourth watch. I saw that watch after watch was in the past. Because of this, should we, should there be lack of vigilance? That's a question. Oh, no! Exclamation. There is the greater necessity of unceasing watchfulness. For now, the moments are fewer than before the passing of the first watch. Now the period of waiting is necessarily shorter than at first. If we watched with unbated vigilance then, how much more need of double watchfulness in the second watch? The second watch has passed, brought us to the third watch, and now we need what? Triple. Let me read that. The third watch calls for threefold earnestness. We are now, my friends, in what? The fourth watch, quadruple earnestness. Let me finish up here. To become impatient now would be to lose all our earnestness, persevering watching heretofore. The long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy. Why has Christ delayed to end the fourth watch? Why, brothers and sisters, why? Because Jesus, in 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible clearly says, my friends, listen to me attentively. The Bible says, God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing any one of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why he has delayed his coming so long in the fourth watch. But verse number 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And my friends, on page 196 of volume 2, this is not principally and only for those in the world and those who are lukewarm SDA, the worldling, yes, the nominal SDA. No, it's for those who also believe in present truth, just as the five foolish virgins believe in present truth. Hear what this says. Watch carefully. Paragraph number two, page 196. I have been shown that God's people who profess to believe present truth are not, are not in a waiting, watching position. They are increasing in riches and are laying up their treasures upon the earth. They are becoming rich in worldly things, but not rich toward God. They do not believe, they do not believe in the shortness of the time. They do not believe that the end of all things is at hand. They do not believe that Christ is at the door. 
present truth believers of SDA. Last sentence here, it says, their works show the character of their faith and testify to those around them that the coming of Christ is not to be in this generation. Present truth believers, brothers and sisters. Now, let me close with this. Do you know, whenever people talk about the armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6, what parts do they generally emphasize of the armor of God? They speak about the helmet. They speak about the belt. They speak about the shoes. They speak about the sword. They speak about the shield. But why do they omit watchfulness and prayer? It's a part of the armor. Ephesians chapter 6, give me verse number 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Put on the whole armor, brothers and sisters. And in closing, what does Jesus say? In Matthew 26, just before he was crucified, captured by church and state, what did he say in Matthew 26? Watch and pray, he says. Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. While the flesh is weak, the flesh is weak. Jesus says, the spirit indeed is willing to keep us watchful, prayerful, and also prepared. Did you understand what you heard today? Was this a warning, an appeal to your heart today? Will you say with me, by God's grace, Lord, keep me. Let me cut that short. Lord, help me to put on the whole armor. The whole armor. Type in those words. Gospel vocal brothers will sing the song. Watch ye saints. Lo, he comes. Send in your prayer requests. Thank you for joining us for Midday Passage. We'll be singing a hymn titled, Watch Ye Saints. We hope you are blessed. Watch ye saints, with eyelids working, low the paths. O heaven a shaking, keep your lamps. O trimmed and burning, ready for your Lord's returning. Lo, he comes. Lord Jesus comes. Lo, he comes. He comes, O oh, glorious Jesus comes to reign victorious. Lo, He comes, yes, Jesus comes. Nations ring, the proud and steady Christ is King. The mess names great be at Halle. The spines is summing, shout he sends, Your Lord is coming, Lo, He comes. Lord Jesus comes, Lord he comes, he comes, oh glorious Jesus comes, to land victorious, Lord he comes, yes Jesus comes, sinners come, where Christ is pleading. Where Christ is pleading.